The Triumph Stag has looks and sophisticated style. Those Italian lines of this easy Grand Tourer looked epic when it was released in 1970, and the lucrative North American market beckoned. With a throaty 3.0-litre V8 engine, it had the power to take on its six-cylinder rival, the Mercedes SL. Yet in just seven years, production ended and it was all over. So what happened? It was the engine. Why did this beautiful car falter and die? I told you, it was the engine. Shut up. This is the Triumph Stag story. In 1964, the Italian car designer Giovanni Michelotti reached out to Triumph. He wanted to show off his take on the Grand Tourer, so asked them if they could donate one of their new Triumph 2000 saloons. Triumph and Michelotti had been a good team since the late 50s, and he designed the Herald, Spitfire and TR4. Triumph design chief Harry Webster agreed and sent over a Triumph 2000 that had just helped support its Spitfires in the Le Mans 24-hour race. So in 1965, Michelotti shortened the car and made the rear end similar to the styling he'd done on the Triumph Spitfire. But the front was all new and would go on to be the face of the newly restyled Triumph 2000 in 1969. When Harry Webster had agreed to donate the car, he negotiated first right of refusal to Michelotti's design. Once he saw the stunning design that had been created, he was smitten. The car wasn't even shown at a trade show. It was immediately taken back to Triumph's headquarters at Canley to begin work to put it into production. Triumph would create a car that could beat the Mercedes SL. Except they couldn't work on it right away. Triumph was strapped for cash, and priority had to be given to the 1300 and TR5 release. But the company kept the faith. The Triumph 2000 was a success the company had hoped for, and the GT variant could help them crack the lucrative North American market. The original intention was to use the Triumph 2000 six-cylinder 2.0-litre engine but they soon realized they needed more power, so decided the 2.5 litre inline 6 would be more appropriate. But then they changed their minds again. Triumph sold cars that used peppy four-cylinder engines, but they needed larger engines as well. What if they could design a new four-cylinder and use two of them together to make a V8? If they could make an engine that flexible, this would slash their production costs. This plan dated back to 1963, before the Stag prototype had even been thought of, but with delays in getting it out the door, the Stag seemed the perfect first car to use this new breed of engine. North America loved its V8 engines, and Triumph realized the 2.5 litre six cylinder wasn't going to be fast enough. Triumph didn't make a V8, so it made sense to develop one for this new car. Work started in 1966 on the new V8 engine, and it was expected the 2.5 litre six cylinder would be offered as well. But while this was happening, they found problems with the car's rigidity. Michelotti's design looked beautiful, but without a roof, the Triumph 2000's chassis handled terribly, something it had never been designed to do in the first place. The team made the decision to put a strengthening bar across the car, just behind the doors, and to connect it to the windscreen with a T-bar. By 1967, development on the Stag project was in full flow, but another spanner was thrown in the works. Arch Rivals Rover was subsumed into Triumph's parent British Leyland, so both companies were under the same roof. This in itself wasn't a problem, but there was enormous pressure to use Rover's existing 3.5 litre V8 engine. It was a proven design, and it made sense to rationalise the number of engines in the new, larger company. Why spend time on a new engine? To add to the pressure, 
the new head of development was Rover Spen King, and he was very familiar with the advantages of the Rover V8 engine. But although he pushed to adopt it, Triumph's management pushed back. They claimed that the Rover V8 just wouldn't fit. But this wasn't the case, as it's been retrofitted to Stags many times since. It's more likely that the Rover V8's different torque and weight would have meant further redesign delays on the project, now already five years old. Another issue was where those Rover engines would come from. Current production was going to the Rover P6, and it would be used in the upcoming Range Rover and the Rover SD1. To produce more would require additional tooling and dies. It seems that Triumph wanted to press on with its new engine, and wanted the four-cylinder variant for its small cars such as the Triumph Dolomite in the 1970s. It's easy to think that if the Rover integration had happened just a year earlier, when the engine program was still in its infancy, and the Stag wasn't so close to production, that the Rover engine would have been used, but Triumph pressed on with their one engine to rule them all. It's clear that Leyland management should have stepped in at this point to rationalise their engine list, as the larger British Leyland now had more engines than they could shake a stick at, and they needed a new engine like they needed a hole in the head. The Triumph V8 engine hit development troubles, and its size was increased to 3 litres, but it was always almost ready, with the release date getting pushed back again and again. But Triumph pressed on. They knew that with Rover and Triumph under the same wing, it was only a matter of time before the two teams rationalised into one smaller team, and they wanted to show what they could do. The Triumph Stag was eventually released in 1970 to much praise. The seven-year-old Michelotti design was still fresh, and customers loved it. With a 0-60 time of 10.7 seconds, the 3-litre V8 made it a little underpowered when compared to the competition, but when allied to the smooth 3-speed automatic gearbox, you just didn't care. The car had a high-spec trim with features such as electric windows, and the company geared up to sell it in North America. But it quickly became apparent there were some major problems with that new V8 engine. I told you it was the engine. Production quality issues meant ill-fitting engine components, but there were some serious design problems as well. For example, the water pump was set above the engine. If the engine became hot in traffic, coolant escaped from the cooling system via the expansion bottle, and when the engine cooled down again, the reduced overall volume of fluid then fell below the level of the pump. As well as preventing coolant from circulating, this also caused rapid failure of the pump. Even when the system was topped up again, the failed water pump could not circulate the coolant and further overheating ensued. The timing belt would stretch prematurely, meaning it needed to be changed after just 25,000 miles. There was a problem with the arrangement of cylinder head fixing studs, half of which were vertical and the other half at an angle. The angled studs, when heated and cooled, expanded and contracted at a different rate to the alloy heads, causing sideways forces which caused premature failure of the cylinder head gaskets. And a poor choice of engine materials caused problems. The block was made from iron and the heads from aluminium, a combination that required the use of corrosion inhibiting antifreeze all year round. This point wasn't widely appreciated by owners or the dealer network supporting them. Consequently, engines were affected by electrolytic corrosion and white alloy oxide sludge collected in radiator cores, reducing radiate efficiency, causing overheating. The result was head gasket failure due to cylinder head heat distortion, a very expensive repair, and owners would usually get their repaired cars back with the radiator still clogged leading to repeat failures. It took time to discover these issues as so few stags were being sold at dealerships. British Leyland had around 2,500 UK dealers when the stag was on sale, and a total of around 19,000 
were sold in the UK over seven years. This means the average dealer sold only seven or eight stags during the car's whole production run, or roughly one car a year. So dealers saw defective stags so infrequently they couldn't recognize and diagnose the cause of the various problems. By the time the problems were known, there was no money to fix them. The V8 engine wasn't being used in any other car. And with low sales of the stag and British Leyland's poor financial health, nothing was done to fix this beautiful looking car. Despite being featured in the Bond film Diamonds Are Forever in 1971, those reliability problems forced the stag to beat a hasty retreat from the North American market in 1973. In 2007, Time would list the Stag as one of the 50 worst made cars of all time. The V8 was a disaster, but if you remember, Triumph had hoped this was to be used as a four-cylinder as well. So what happened to that? The first version rolled off the production line in 1968, with Saab as the customer for their 99. They had exclusive use of it for the first four years, and the next use was Triumph's own Dolomite in 1972. It also got used by the Pantera Rio and Triumph TR7. Production ended in 1981, when the TR7 was phased out. Unlike the doomed V8, the four-cylinder engine was relatively reliable, and had lots of power. It had the same cooling system foibles, and needed antifreeze, but by the time of its Dolomite introduction, these problems were understood and regular servicing meant the car could stay reliable. Triumph had hoped the Stag would be a Mercedes SL killer, but by 1971 a new version of the Mercedes had been released, replacing the 2.8 litre six cylinder engine with a Stag beating 3.5 litre V8. And if you didn't mind having a roof on your GT, there was a Reliant Scimitar GTE, or newly released Ford Capri 3000 GT and Citroen SM. The unreliable Triumph Stag got swamped by the competition. By 1972, a replacement was in the works. With the success of the Ford Capri, British Leyland wanted something similar. They resurrected the 1967 Michelotti style Triumph Lynx design that was meant to compete with the MGB GT. But in 1972, Michelotti was out and stylist Harris Mann was in. Trying for working on the TR7, so the Lynx was essentially an extended TR7 turned into a coupe. The plan was to make use of the MG four cylinder O series engine and also a V8, but it would be the Rover V8 powering the car the unreliable Triumph engine had been abandoned. With spare production at the number two speak plant, work began to start production in 1977. But this coincided with a long drawn out industrial action battle at speak, started the day the new British Leyland boss, Michael Edwards, took up the top job. With Edwards losing patience, he closed the number two speak plant in 1978 killing off the links in the process. Production of the Stag ended in 1977, with only 25,000 being sold. There was to be no replacement. It took until the early 1990s for the next Grand Tourer with the Rover 800 Coupe, and this wasn't an open top. The Stag was a great idea an open-top Grand Tourer that Mercedes continues to sell today as the SL, but too much work needed to be done to the Triumph 2000 saloon chassis, and British Leyland shouldn't have greenlit the Triumph V8 engine and should have moved quickly to rationalize its engines to save costs. But hindsight is 2020, and it's easy to see problems after the fact. If the V8 had delivered on its promises, and been demonstrably better than the Rover engine, it could have been used across British Leyland's fleet into the 70s and 80s. To keep my videos free from adverts, to get early access to new videos, or appear in the credits yourself, please consider supporting me using the Patreon link below from just $1 or 80p a month.
and hit the subscribe button to get notified of new videos. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.